Morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the COVID-19 committee. We have apologies from Ross Greer, MSP, and Beatrice Richard, MSP, who are both attending other parliamentary committees this morning. I would also like to welcome Willie Rennie, MSP, to the meeting, who is a substitute for Beatrice, and Christine Graham, MSP, who has an interest in the matters uh, we are discussing and considering today. And I welcome Christine to this meeting. First of all, uh, we have various declarations of interest to go through. Can I ask Stuart Stevenson for any relevant declaration of interest? Uh, thank you, convener. It, it's simply to record that I am the complainant uh, in a criminal trial which is expected to take place uh, before a jury, and accordingly, I will take no part in uh, that part of the meeting that refers to procedures uh, in court and related matters. Thank you, Kavina. I'm grateful for that. Can I next ask Willie Rennie, MSP, for any relevant declaration of interest? No, convener, I have nothing to declare. Thank you. Can I next and finally ask Christine Graham for any relevant declaration of interest? No, I have none. Thank you for that. Uh, this morning, we are taking evidence from stakeholders from a range of sectors to obtain their views generally on the Scottish Government's proposal to extend the use of some of its emergency powers and to expire other provisions early under the Coronavirus Scotland Act. I would like to welcome our witnesses to this meeting. Linda Bald, who is the Bruce and John Usher Professor of Public Health and the co-director of the Centre of Population Health Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. Sarah Booth, who is a legal officer representing the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Michael Clancy, who is the Director of Law Reform at the Law Society of Scotland. And Helen Martin, who is the Deputy General Secretary for Policy, Political Liaison and Equalities at the Scottish Trade Union Congress. I will now turn to questions, and if I may begin by asking the first question. Uh, this question is a general one for any of our witnesses. And perhaps they could answer if they want to answer in the order that I've just read out. Extending emergency legislation is a significant step when it comes to individual liberty. For example, the committee has received several submissions relating to the rights of children and the impact extending emergency legislation has on them. Can I ask what is the justification for an extension to emergency powers here in the view of our witnesses? And if I could ask Linda Bald first. Thank you very much, convener. So I've been invited to give evidence again to the committee today to provide a public health perspective. I don't have any legal expertise or nor a human rights, which I know are issues at hand. What I would just say in terms of opening remarks in response to that question, we're still in the middle of a global crisis. We have uh, 25 million cases globally, over 900,000 deaths. In Scotland, we've seen over 4,000 deaths, and as you will all have heard from the Scottish Government recently, unfortunately, our numbers of cases are rising again, and Scotland, in common with many countries in the world, has many more months to run in terms of the public health consequences of dealing with a new virus. And it's understandable that states, nations around the world have to use um, necessary powers to allow the public health protection that our population deserves to remain in place. And therefore, I think that as long as it is proportionate and the needs and rights of all groups are considered, we do have to recognise that now is the time, in my personal view, to extend the appropriate parts um, of this legislation to help us deal with this ongoing crisis, which I hope by the time we get to next spring, we will be in a better place than we are now. Thank you. Can I ask Sarah Booth next for her views? Um, many thanks, convener, for the opportunity to speak to uh, the committee this morning. Um, we understand the need to take measures to protect the population to deal with the ongoing crisis. Now, the Commission understands and believes that it is a fundamental principle of human rights law that measures that impact on an individual's rights and freedoms should be lawful, necessary, proportionate and time limited. And for these reasons, we've, we've welcomed the Scottish Government's commitment to um, 
to human rights in addressing the significant challenges of COVID-19. And in particular, we welcome the, the commitment to reviewing this legislation and to re lifting restrictions as soon as they are deemed no longer necessary um, to protect against coronavirus. Thank you. Uh, Michael Cancy, please. Good uh, morning, everyone, and uh, good morning, Camino. Thank you for uh, that interesting question. Um, I, I think uh, both uh, Professor Bold uh, and uh, our colleague from USHRC, Sarah Booth, have uh, explained the framework there. Um, uh, there is still an ongoing coronavirus crisis. Uh, it, uh, it has not gone away. Uh, and uh, the legislation which was enacted earlier in the year still has a role to play in keeping society safe uh, and making sure that uh, we are not um, uh, exposed unduly to uh, the virus. So I think um, I think I, I could say the laws which have been passed and there have been many subordinate. Uh, orders passed through the Scottish Parliament. I think the total yesterday was something like 64 um, uh, regulations concerning coronavirus. Uh, that shows you the breadth of activity uh, which needs to be done uh, in terms of keeping us safe. Um, the word proportionality uh, was used, uh, and uh, I think Ms Booth uh, mentioned the, the, that, that uh, uh, court quartet of lawful, necessary, proportionate and time-limited. Um, uh, the legislation is clearly uh, lawful in as much as it has been uh, properly scrutinised and passed. Um, it is necessary because the government deem, as a result of the scientific information which they have received, uh, that it is necessary uh, and it is proportionate. Uh, I know there was a debate about proportionality uh, at another meeting of the committee, and perhaps we can come back to that, or if you want, I can say a few words about it now. Um, uh, and it is time limited, and of course, uh, these regulations which uh, are before the committee today uh, indicate uh, the time limited nature um, and the require to extend if the uh, statutory time limits have been met. So uh, I don't know if you want me to go further on proportionality, convener, but. Uh, I, I think it would help if you could actually just say a few words about proportionality, seeing as we're considering it now. Um, I was interested to read the debate, uh, which took place a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, when uh, Jean Freeman was before the committee, and and uh, Professor Tompkins um, uh, narrowed in on the uh, introductory paragraph of the regulations, which uh, were then under consideration. Um, uh, talking about legislation being necessary and proportionate, and he focused on uh, the regulations being the least restrictive available means of uh, achieving the aim of government. And I think um, uh, least restrictive uh, is, of course, one component of, of proportionality. Um, uh, it's uh, I, I, some have described it as um, a, considering the aim to be achieved. Whether or not it is a legitimate aim, legislation is used to achieve that aim. Uh, being a component uh, of, of that consideration, that would include questions which government would ask themselves before bringing an order before the parliament. It would be why are the rights being restricted? Um, uh, is there, uh, what's the problem which needs to be uh, resolved? Uh, will the restriction um, uh, lead to a reduction in the problem? Um, uh, does a less restrictive alternative exist? Um, and has sufficient regard been paid to the rights uh, of the people affected? So I think it, it, proportionality is, is a, a sum of many parts, convener, uh, and not simply the least restrictive. But I'm sure that uh, government has these things in mind, because, of course, the consequences of getting it wrong could mean that uh, action is taken against the government for uh, one of, of the orders of teaching uh, human rights, um, uh, perhaps. Uh, and so uh, they will be very cautious about bringing forward orders where that uh, 
whole aspect of proportionality and these other considerations that have not been taken into account. Thank you for that. Can I finally ask Helen Martin for her view uh, on this on this point, please? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I think my point is very similar to other witnesses. Um, the reason why we need emergency powers to continue is because the crisis continues. Um, if we think about it in terms of uh, the actions that people need to take, you know, we still need the general public to take specific action in their own life. We still need action to be taken in the workplace in order to put in mitigations that stop the spread of the virus. And it's for that reason that we we do need to continue to have the some level of powers enacted because it simply isn't business as usual. Uh, I'm grateful for that. My, my next question is a is a follow on to that. Um, in various lockdowns to date, the Scottish government have sometimes used guidance and sometimes used regulations to direct the public. Um, do witnesses think that that is an effective method? Uh, and what um, implications does that distinction have for parliamentary scrutiny and for enforcement? Perhaps I could ask Professor Bald if she has a view, first of all. Certainly. So if I just reflect on wider public health measures where guidance and regulation both have distinct purposes. So guidance is effectively giving, and, and I think in this crisis as well, evidence-based information to the public about actions that need to be taken. So to use examples here, the facts campaign, the, the um, behaviours that we are asked to engage in as part of that, that public health campaign. Um, however, in some cases, enforcement, which is necessary, regulations are necessary to empower or make possible enforcement, is needed to send a clear message to the public that if there are breaches of what is effectively guidance, there, there are regulations which allow the police or others to take action. So, the very good examples in this would obviously be being able to take action on large gatherings if people are doing those unnecessarily. Um, also being able um, to, to take action if people are being put at risk in particular groups. It's not just police powers, but other uh, public bodies as well. So I think the two are um, important. And I'll, I'll give you an example from another public health topic, perhaps not as relevant, but we think back to the introduction of smoke-free legislation. That was largely guidance to the public to not smoke in indoor public places, but it was supported by fines around signage and also compliance. And even though very few of those powers, uh, those regulations were ever needed in terms of enforcement, very few numbers, it did send a stronger message to the public um, that it was slightly stronger than just advice, which is how the public might interpret guidance. So I think both are needed, but um, often guidance in, in itself is sufficient. Okay. I don't know if uh, Sarah would like to contribute to this. Yes, thank you, convener. Um, it's our position that um, legality and, and the lawfulness of, of um, regulations are vital in addressing the crisis. Um, in this situation, um, laws can, can be useful for, for people to use to hold um, abuses of power to account. So, for example, we would um, we would support a human rights based approach to legislation and policies which ensure there are mechanisms of accountability, and and we, we think that's that's very important to have, particularly regulations um, to to provide those mechanisms to people. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Would you like to contribute? Hey, thank you, convener. Um, thank you, convener. Um, let me see. Uh, if we uh, we thought it was good enough uh, simply to have guidance, then there would have been no need for three coronavirus acts uh, and um, uh, hundreds of regulations across the UK. Um, uh, guidance can only go so far uh, in. Um, advising people uh, of the behaviours which will keep them and others safe. And that's the fundamental bottom line here, that, that this is the objective uh, of the guidance. Uh, but um, uh, the guidance, uh, I think, we're wise enough to know that, that uh, um, uh, some people will not follow advice, even if it is very good advice. Um, and therefore, there has to be some kind of 
uh, legal framework uh, which establishes the ground rules for uh, behaviour in uh, the, the midst of the, the pandemic. Uh, and so, therefore, it is important that we realise that, that uh, the regulations are uh, of supreme importance because that is where uh, the, the issues which uh, Sarah has highlighted about legality uh, uh, crystallise. Uh, the, uh, uh, the regulations have to be scrutinised um, uh, by Parliament and passed. Um, uh, although many of them are made affirmative regulations. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I think it is fair to say that, that uh, regulations are uh, of primary importance uh, and the guidance should supplement uh, and, and uh, explain uh, those regulations. And that is where I think there is an issue about communication sometimes, uh, where um, uh, ministers and others may uh, uh, um, describe the guidance, uh, give guidance uh, in such a way that it doesn't necessarily match up with the text of the regulation. And uh, I remember very clearly in the early days of uh, dealing with uh, the uh, coronavirus legislation uh, that uh, there were occasional references to being able to exercise for an hour a day. Uh, but if one looked at the regulations, the regulations uh, were quite clear uh, that um, an individual subject to all this uh, should not leave their house uh, unless it was to take exercise. But um, I see I've just been muted uh, in, uh, in video terms, uh, but uh, it, there was no time limit on the exercise stated in the regulations. So I think that uh, we've got to be careful about communication of uh, guidance uh, to make sure that it conforms to the, reg to the regulations because the law matters. Thank you, Michael. I, I think we're having some problems um, with with your connection, and I think for that reason um, the broadcasting team have have taken your video off, but we can can still hear you, um, and I hope we can resolve that. Um, I'll move finally to um, Helen Martin for for her answer on this, and um, uh, and then I'll um, the next question will come from Shona Robertson. Uh, thank you. I think um, the issue here is one where I think the vast majority of ordinary people don't actually necessarily understand what is being given as guidance and what is being given as legislation. So oftentimes, what really matters to people is the tone in which the guidance is given. So it's similar to the, the point that Michael was making. People are really relying on the way that it is expressed from the First Minister. Um, so there are examples of, of things that were really just guidance being accepted by the public as legislation in the example Michael just described. But there's also examples of things being given initially as guidance and not very well accepted by the public and then having to move to legislation. So, for example, the face coverings in public transport. I mean, there was quite a long period of time where that was just guidance. And actually, there was a, there was a, a feeling from the government that you know, they needed to put that into legislation because the numbers of people using face coverings was so low. And actually, um, the people who even were using face coverings on buses were saying, um, I feel so uncomfortable using this because so few people are using it that they needed to make it mandatory in order to actually see people using it in numbers. And I think there is that kind of, um, I think that leads me to the point where if people feel that it's a requirement and they feel that there's some level of enforcement behind it, then they will start to comply because the vast majority of people are law abiding. But um, it's about creating that, that feeling that things need to be done. And sometimes legislation is the only way to do that. But it is also, I think, useful to issue guidance and, and encouragement as well, and at times that can be sufficient in order to get people to change their behaviour. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn to um, other colleagues. Um, before I do say, can I just remind um, members of the committee and attendees to perhaps pause for a couple of seconds just before they ask their question um, so, so broadcasting can, can hear it? Um, and I would also say that if you, I've asked my questions to every member, every witness attending, but um, colleagues may wish to direct uh, specific questions to specific witnesses. 
So first of all, please can I ask Shona Robertson for her questions? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of issues around consent and um, public consent and um, communication. Um, it strikes me we're entering into quite a, a difficult period uh, dealing with the virus in that there is having to be fairly quick decisions taken uh, around measures uh, that that have to be um, uh, um, put in place. So whether we take the local lockdowns <coughs> that have happened uh, here in, in the west of Scotland or indeed as England have just announced their changes to the, the number of people who can meet indoors and outdoors with some pretty hefty fines uh, by way of enforcement. So I guess maybe turning to Professor Linda Bolden and John Usher first, um, have you any view about how um, public consent and communication to the public uh, is best carried out at a time where things are changing almost on a week-to-week -week basis? Um, and what is your view around the, the level of public support for these measures? I mean, there is a view that there is a, a you know a difference in terms of the the age of the population and whether or not young people, for example, are adhering uh, to to the guidance and to the regulations. So, is there more, I guess, that uh, that government can do that the, the, the agencies that can do to to um, you know, try to get that communication across during this very challenging period of time that I think we're entering into. Thank you very much, Shona. So you've raised, I think, three issues there. The issues around the timing of announcement of um, new measures, the, um, the public support uh, for that, which I do think is going to be an ongoing issue, and then how do we support different groups to comply and what evidence is there on that from data that we have. So the first thing from a public health perspective, the main reason, as you're all aware, why some of these changes are introduced incredibly rapidly is because time is absolutely crucial when you have virus that's highly infectious and moves incredibly quickly. So the reason why things are introduced with just a few hours notice often or 24 hours is because as soon as the data suggests that you know one person could spread it to another, and, and look, looking at our R numbers, as you know, they're now up between 0 0.9 and 1.4, so there really is potentially in some communities active spread. Uh, you need to shut down those chains of transmission ASAP. So that's the reason for speed. But I don't think that the public actually understand that as well as they could. They probably understand it better here in Scotland because we continue to have daily briefings, um, but and far less so in England. So I, from a behavioural perspective, I think it would be helpful in one of the briefings for actually one of our colleagues to say very clearly why things like uh, local restrictions are imposed with just a few hours notice, comment on, for example, countries adding or not to the quarantine list, although they have mentioned some of the reasons for that. And that's because, again, from a behavioural perspective, clear communication and trying to explain precisely what the evidence is is very helpful. So in some of the in interviews I've been doing this morning on the new restrictions in England, I was quite rightly asked, why are they coming in next Monday? Why are these? Why are there several days delay for that in contrast to Bolton that were given 24 hours for a new quite restrictive local lockdown? So better communication on that is key. That said, and bear with me, convener, because I, I want to go into a little bit of details. This might take a few minutes. Is um, there's absolutely it's absolutely crystal clear from the UCL social impacts survey and others that public support for the government's approach in Scotland is significantly higher than it is in England and indeed uh, other parts of the UK. Scotland is at the top of that when you look at the graphs. That has been the case from early in the pandemic. What we've seen in recent months, however, all across the UK and in Scotland is that there's a gradient, so it's declining. Public support is declining for the measures that are being put in place and for the government's uh, messaging and, and, um, and the measures generally. And the support is lower among men uh, compared to women, but not all groups of men, and it's slightly lower um, amongst young people, and compliance is lower amongst young people. But that is not um, unusual to me. You, if you look at any risk behaviour or any patterns of understanding government uh, policies, that is often the case. 
So I think that we do need a nuanced approach to communicating to different groups in order to maintain support. And I am very, very, very concerned about the next few months and potential unrest. Um, we're seeing it globally around the world, um, groups that are spreading misinformation, but also just gathering, as they, we have already seen in Scotland, to express um, distaste or distrust in the messaging and in the guidance that's being given. And I think that we're going to have to be very careful to keep on top of that, because history shows that following pandemics, and there is research on this, there is social unrest. And so we need to um, be cognizant of that. And just my final point, in terms of, uh, Shona, you asked, how do you enhance engagement? You need a stratified, targeted approach to communicate to different groups in the population. So how we might communicate to older people who were shielding will be different from how we communicate to young people in school or those who've just left school. And um, it's different when it's people from different ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, and so we need to support our third sector and community groups and others um, to make sure that they have adequate resources to diffuse or disseminate the public health messaging appropriately to their communities and to build engagement and ownership. Because again, research shows that a tailored segmented approach rather than just national campaigns is really important. Sorry, that was a lengthy response. You know, I hope that was <laughs> Thank you for that. That that was some fascinating information co contained there, uh, Professor Bold. I wonder if I could just also ask a question about balance of risk. Um, it strikes me again that we are, um, as well as the, the, the numbers beginning to go up, we're also entering a really difficult period with uh, enhanced risk. So whether it's um, students going back to universities, uh, more people going back to offices, all of which gives the, the virus opportunities to spread. I wanted to ask Helen Martin, particularly from the STUC, whether um, she shares that concern and whether or not um, she thinks that it is important to reiterate the, uh, the, 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 the plea, if you like, that if you are able to work from home, then that is what you should do in order to um, try to uh, reduce that risk of spread, among, among, particularly among offices. It would be interesting to get Helen's view on that. Uh, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I think our position is very much a safety first position. And if working from home is working, then there is absolutely no reason for anybody to return to offices over the next period. In fact, um, we are look, we are we are working on a working group just now that is looking at this very issue, and we have been taking evidence around the economic impact of office closures. And it's not as clear cut as the debate might um, currently look. There is a lot of discussion about the economic impact on city centres of offices being closed. But there is also an element around the displacement of economic activity into towns and other rural locations, which is supporting the economy in those regions. So it is not as clear cut as the debate might suggest that office workers working at home is, is a clear economic drag. And in some ways, it can actually boost the economy of certain local areas. Um, equally, we are very clear that um, office workers returning could put really severe um, pressure on public transport. Uh, which is a particular risk area, I think, given that it's an enclosed space, people are within one meter, they're, you know, potentially with strangers. It, it's it's not good to see a sort of peak around commute times, which currently doesn't exist. But if office workers go back, then we would be likely to see that sort of pattern of behaviour um, re-emerge, and that would be very very negative indeed. You then have to think about the types of office buildings that people are returning to. Some of them have quite, um, you know, they, they don't have windows that open. They have air conditioning systems that circulate air. These are all potentially quite problematic things as we move in into winter. And if it's unnecessary for people to be in those spaces and they are working effectively at home, then we think for, uh, for the balance of public health good, people should be staying at home, working at home and continuing in, in that way. Thank you, uh, Convener. That's my questions finished. I just wonder, though, if Helen Martin would agree to maybe share that research with the committee once it's uh, completed. 
Uh, yes, I believe that should be fine. Um, I can I can take that away as an action. Thank you for that, and grateful for for that offer. Um, please, can I next turn to Christine Graham for a question? Well, th thank you very much, convener. I'm very much obliged to let me come along. Extremely interesting. I wish I'd come to this committee before. Um, I'm interested that the data on transmission is quite often related to gatherings within households and so-called house parties. But I want to focus, if I may, on commercial uh, house parties or large gatherings, raves, things like this, uh, and to put it into the context of, um, I think, Professor Baltic, a segmented approach when you're um, enforcing or putting forward regulations that um, takes, takes away some liberties. I mean, currently, my, my understanding, and I, I stand to be corrected by uh, Michael Clancy, probably, and Professor Ball and others, is that those attending such a thing as a large house party or a rave, they are subject to COVID regulations and can be fined, if necessary, by the police. But those organising or permitting to be organised in a place are not subject to COVID regulations, but, in fact, have to be pursued under the criminal law, as has happened in my constituency, where there were 300, and the police had to use the criminal law. Now, I'm looking at deterrent rather, deterrence rather than um, police having to be involved all the time. So, what I'm wanting to ask uh, whoever thinks this is relevant, I think from a public health point of view and from a legal point of view, do you think we require regulations targeted at those who organise or permit to be organised at these large gatherings or raves, and they're commercial? And you know, would you think that perhaps substantial fines and even confiscating their profits uh, would be something that could be considered, given that it seems to be the way that we are now going? We're going to get tougher. And do you think that would reduce transmission in any substantial way? Because as far as I know, track trace is almost impossible. Uh, and do you think this would have public support? Because I hear what um, Professor Bald says about unrest and so on. So. I agree, you have to take the public with you. So, in all that context, as we get into the dangers of winter and people getting restive, you know, what is your view on that particular issue, perhaps extending regulations? Should we, should we have um, uh, Linda first and then perhaps Michael to answer that, if that's okay? Certainly. Thanks, convener, and thank you, Christine. Obviously, I can't comment on the, um, the, the nuances between those two different aspects in terms of how the law works, but I, I absolutely understand your point from a public health perspective. So these large indoor events, I mean, at the moment, are highly irresponsible. Um, I think people are frustrated. Uh, the people who attend those events are, are frustrated. They want life to return uh, to more normality and to be able to socialise and see their friends and enjoy themselves, particularly if they're back in education or work. Understand that. We're concerned about that in the university sector, as you would anticipate. Um, but I think that it is correct that in terms of um, pursuing uh, or using regulation or the law to penalise people, it is entirely appropriate that there should be much more severe um, consequences for those who irresponsibly organise these events, because the people attending wouldn't be there unless it had been organised by somebody. Um, and so, if there is a mismatch there that you've highlighted, that does need to be dealt with. And again, to return to my earlier point in the opening comments that the convener asked for, um, enforcement and penalties are useful from a public health perspective because they enhance compliance. And I think that Helen was saying in the case of uh, face coverings, um, if you have, um, if the public know that if they don't follow guidance, that there will be a consequence to that, but then you do see compliance increases. We see that consistently. You, choose, you pick a public health topic, and that that is the case. Um, so I think those organising really need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that they, um, you know, there, there are consequences to them doing that. And of course, people want to profit, and they don't care about public health when they're thinking about making a profit. So uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. Michael? Thank you, convener. Um, yes, um, it, it is an extremely interesting and topical um, uh, matter which Christine Graham has raised. Uh, I can't say that the Law Society has uh, thought about this very deeply, um, but um, 
what what I am aware of is that a uh, situation in England and Wales where uh, these reeves uh, and, and uh, house parties have, have uh, been a problem in the recent past uh, has been dealt with by amendments to the coronavirus restriction on gathering regulations, uh, which uh, can impose on organisers of uh, these events um, uh, fines of uh, up to £10,000. So that is a pretty hefty uh, fine for uh, contravening uh, the prohibition on, on having gatherings of um, uh, up to 300 people or whatever the, the number might be. Um, uh, that, that is not the situation in Scotland, uh, as Christine Graham has pointed out. Uh, but uh, it might be worthwhile uh, looking at that, those regulations as they apply in England and Wales and, and uh, uh, ascertaining whether there is anything which uh, any gap in our provision which could be filled by something like uh, those regulations. The attention of the committee and uh, perhaps uh, others will will hear the uh, the message too. Can I just say thank you? That's just very helpful. I wasn't aware of the English regulations. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I uh, please next turn to Willie Rennie? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, my question is for Professor Bald, and it's about the clarity and the simplicity of the message. And we've seen that in England there's been a change to the limit on six inside and outside in terms of gatherings. And we've had increased restrictions, particularly in the west of Scotland, up to a million people. Um, but yet this weekend we're going to restart the, the spectators viewing football matches in two particular cases, and we had the rugby um, just the weekend before. And I'm just wondering whether Professor Bald has a view on about whether, as we move through the different phases, um, this is adding to complexity and potentially causing mixed messages. Good question. I mean, again, you see from the data, Willie, that's been pulled together from the surveys that as we've moved out of lockdown, and this is the case in lots of other countries, not here, um, it, the messaging becomes more complex and people's understanding becomes more limited. Um, and I think the best example probably is the first one you gave. If you if you were to ask me, and I'm spending almost all my time on this topic nowadays to rehearse back to you the number of people you can meet in which settings across the, the different devolved nations, I actually couldn't tell you quickly. I have a rough idea and I know exactly what it is in Scotland, <clears throat> but it's that level of complexity and I think that um, it does cause confusion, particularly actually within the UK. Um, so in terms of the balance, the question you asked about sporting events and then potentially ongoing restrictions in localities where we see spikes, which I'm I, sadly, I think we'll, we'll continue. It's this tension, and I'm sure we're going to come on to this in the committee, it's this balance that we have to strike in the coming months between living with the virus, because it's going to be with us indefinitely, even with better treatments and a vaccine, and not crippling the economy further. And I'm no expert on uh, uh, sport in Scotland, but my understanding is it's a very important part of our economy and of people's lives. Um, and I do think that there are ways to get of those events with very limited numbers of spectators running again, particularly when it's largely an outdoor event, um, as safely as possible. But that is going to require, as you know, very clear guidance and also clear support for those responsible for the venues and the premises. Um, so I am not opposed to opening up these sectors of the economy if it can be done in a controlled and measured way. Um, but I do think that uh, the biggest risks we face, as um, Helen was already saying, are the socialization indoors in hospitality um, where um, you know, there may be breaches in terms of what people are supposed to do, and also unnecessary indoor working, et cetera, in venues which have poor ventilation, air conditioning, which is going to make things worse, to be frank, from the data we've seen. And um, those are the things that we need to be really, really careful about. Whereas these sporting events, I think, guidance has followed, we shouldn't abandon them. We should try and get these things restarted again. And it would be the same even finally with 
some things like, say, for concerts, where there's been a very interesting trial, as you probably saw in Germany, of trying to see how you would run a live concert with limited numbers and face coverings to allow, you know, the arts to, some of the arts to get up and running again. So it's this coexistence, this balance we have to strike. Um, thank you, Professor Bold. Um, I'd like to move on to the, you know, whether we're managing to have the, the public health measures and control measures that are effective. I'm really concerned that we've gone from almost elimination through to restrictions affecting more than a million people in a large chunk of our country. Um, and in particular, I want to focus on the contributory factors of the quarantine measures and the spot checks but also the test and protect, and whether you have confidence in both of those measures, because we know that there are, there are some reports about compliance and about missing people as well in terms of the quarantine checks. So I'd just be interested in your view on that. Okay, so this is the crux of the issue now, is how did we get to where we are now, which is um, the elimination strategy, zero COVID, as is often called, or maximum suppression, which is probably a better term, is definitely what the Scottish Government has been trying to pursue. And if you look at the data for June, in particular July, we were very successful, actually, as a nation in getting those numbers down to lesser extent part of May as well. So I think we did very well, reasonably well, during the summer. But the problem is the numbers are now up again, and that was not um, unexpected. We all, most of us expected that. And the main drivers for that are briefly, as we know, the virus, because it wasn't totally eliminated like the Faroe Islands or New Zealand, and it was always potentially going to be spreading again when people started moving around more, and that's exactly what has happened. Um, but the other thing, of course, is that we can't cut ourselves off. So I think travel has been a problem. It's absolutely clear that people coming back into the country uh, have, have brought the virus with them. We've got specific examples of that, and quarantine is not being followed. So your two issues, test and protect and quarantine. You ask me, do I think test and protect is working? From the data that I've seen and discussions with my colleagues involved in the system, I think we, it is working very well as much as it can, but there are problems sometimes out with their control. Now, the first part of test and protect is test. That's where the problem is at the moment. I don't think the problem is in the contact tracing. I think the teams are very skilled and they're doing that to the best of their ability. And of course, we'll have the app, which I think is going to add on top of that. Um, but if we can get rapid testing, we really are in trouble. And I think the situation we've seen with people not being able to get access to tests is, is worrying. And uh, the England is in the middle of that right now. Clearly, there's a problem with lab capacity. Um, and so this commitment of the Scottish Government to get up to 60,000 tests a day, you know, what did we do yesterday? 19,000, I think. We're nowhere near that. So testing is absolutely crucial. We need mass testing, more testing. And I think, you know, this committee and others need to keep communicating that message that, and I know it's not Scotland, we're reliant on a UK system as well. We really, really, really must improve our, our capacity and our ability and also to move with technology. So to be doing group testing where you put samples together, they're tested together. If there's no virus in 20 samples, you've heard about that approach. The saliva um, testing, which is now going to be available and is much less invasive and more tolerable for people. These are things that we need to be using. And then finally on quarantine, I think I've said several times publicly that if you look at the, um, there's a good paper published last week that showed that actually only 25% of people, this is a UK paper, who were advised to self-isolate reported in a study that they were doing that comprehensively. And if it was me, you know, I could understand why it might be tough to do that, particularly if you don't have enough resources to be able to do it. And it, incoming travellers are not following the guidance necessarily. We've seen examples of that. And the penalties and the enforcement of that, I think, is, are pretty limited, the follow-up, um, although I can't comment on that in detail. I think looking ahead, um, airport testing is going to be something that we will require. And I know that uh, Scottish and UK governments have been very honest about the fact that there are key questions, first of all, related to um, the, the timing of the second test in particular. So do, do you do it on day five or day eight? And what proportion of cases does that mean that you miss? So there are genuine scientific questions about that. I accept it, but other countries are doing it. But I think the bigger issue why we don't have airport testing yet is an infrastructure one. Um, if you have got a system which is not operating at scale in the community, then to add a layer of very complex new system on top of that, I think is a big, big challenge. But I, 
we'll be relatively confident that we're going to have to embrace that in the future because we have mandatory uh, airport testing, repeat testing. I think that will minimize the risk of um, people not following what essentially is voluntary quarantine. Um, I think there are problems with that. Uh, thank you very much for, for those answers, Professor Ball. Thank you. Thank you. Can I turn next, please, to Willie Coffey? Thank you, convener. Uh, a couple of questions from me. The first one to Michael Clancy, if I may. Uh, Michael, um, reading the letter from Lord Carloway in his evidence to the committee about the administration of justice issue, and what he said was that ensuring that the administration of justice does not grind to a halt due to the backlog in cases demands inventive and enduring political solutions. Could you give us your perspective on where we are with this, whether indeed we are making any progress with this inventive way of solving this huge backlog, in, in particularly in criminal cases? Thank you, uh, Mr. Coffey. Um, it, well, of course, the law of trade is, is, is uh, quite correct, and, uh, and uh, he ends that they can. I'm optimistic the challenge will be readily surmountable. So um, I, I think that that points to uh, what uh, what we've been talking about in uh, in our submission to the committee and in the letter which uh, the president of the society, Amanda Miller, sent to. Adam Tompkins, in his capacity as convener of the Justice Committee, uh, is that uh, um, uh, the, the agencies in the justice system, um, uh, the, the, the courts, the, the uh, uh, SCTS, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, uh, the uh, Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates, um, uh, the Scottish Legal Aid Board, the police prisons, all of us have roles to perform in a making sure that the, uh, the justice system works. Uh, one of our guiding principles in looking at coronavirus legislation has been to uh, uh, try to envisage a justice system where people are kept safe, um, uh, and uh, at the same time, we uphold the interests of justice and the rule of law. Uh, so, um, uh, the innovations which, uh, which I think uh, we are looking at um, uh, are an increased use uh, of uh, uh, legal technology, uh, of, of technology generally, uh, video technology, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and other aspects such as that. Um, uh, and if one looks for creative uh, solutions, uh, then if I could refer to uh, the, uh, the society's letter to President, letter to uh, the Justice Committee. Uh, we we are fully agree uh, with the greater use uh, of technology uh, pr that provides workable solutions uh, and uh, the possibility of remote uh, balloting of jurors, um, utilisation of evidence on commission, public being able to hear trials remotely. That's important for compliance with Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, uh, the, uh, the use of uh, uh, pre-recorded evidence and remote links at police stations uh, for witnesses to give evidence. All of these will help make uh, um, trials to run uh, easier and uh, reduce the need for so many people to attend court. Uh, that's the issue about uh, balloting of jurors is that in, in the olden days, before the, the, the crisis, um, uh, jurors would attend uh, as they had been requested to in the the, the, the notice that they got, and uh, there would be uh, several times the number of 15 jurors which uh, would be needed, and they would be balloted to, to find uh, jurors uh, amongst the, uh, the, the people who attended. Um, and so uh, the other thing is, of course, that all of this new technology has to work. It is quite effective, um, and uh, there has to be uh, adequate training. Everybody uh, who is involved in, in the structure uh, knows uh, how to use that, uh, that technology. Um, there are issues about uh, the vulnerable accused. Uh, um, 
the uh, lots of our legislation deals, of course, with vulnerable witnesses, uh, but the vulnerable accused uh, may not be as well equipped uh, as some witnesses are, um, uh, and of course uh, may not be at liberty. Uh, so we, we've got to think about the rights of the accused person here uh, and how they can get adequate uh, access to a solicitor and advice on uh, what to do in the situation in which they find themselves. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the introduction of virtual custody courts uh, has um, uh, highlighted the issues which uh, arise uh, through earlier lack of co consultation. We published a report uh, which said that uh, there may be some potential advantages in custody courts beyond uh, the immediate need for COVID-19 safety measures, but there were significant practical po problems arising from the pilot which needs to be uh, which need to be ironed out and. We're uh, really uh, pleased that the Lord President has now recognised uh, the need to address these by ceasing uh, any Scotland-wide rollout uh, before the Glasgow pilot, uh, which uh, has now started, can be monitored and evaluated. I hope that answers your question. Mr. It's very, very full, Michael. We're hearing most of what you're saying, so we have our own issues with the technology as well to, to conduct the, the meetings. I was just going to just follow up briefly with you and ask, is the, po the possibilities that the online virtual solution offers us, has that now overcome and become the favourite rather than having um, cinema or hotel settings to administer court proceedings? Do we not need that, even to think about that anymore? Is the online solution probably the direction of travel that we'll take? Um, I think it's important for us to realise that uh, uh, the, the justice system is a big structure uh, with lots of moving parts. Uh, in others, um, uh, you may not have heard my last comment, which was that there is a pilot in Glasgow Sheriff Court. Uh, on a virtual custody court, and we're looking for the evaluation of that uh, before rolling it out, uh, before the courts would roll it out. Um, but uh, I don't think we can just immediately leap to a, a virtual uh, solution because there there's a lot of things which have to be put in place for that to work across the board. Um, that means that uh, we will still need the use of of uh, uh, cinemas or large venues, uh, which was a solution which uh, we suggested to Lady Dorian's uh, jury trials working group. Um, uh, that, uh, that 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 still has to go on because uh, our court system still has to function in a way which is safe for everyone, for jurors, for witnesses, for the court staff, uh, for the judges, and for the lawyers who are involved. Uh, and that's, that's a, a key feature. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, there may be some future point where um, there is uh, a, a preference for virtual uh, courts, but at the moment, we're not quite there yet. Okay, thank you very much for that, Michael. I wonder, convener, if I could ask my second question uh, this time to Linda Bald. Linda, you must be aware of the the argument and the debate surrounding vitamin D. And uh, one of our colleagues in her submission to the committee today, Helga Brain, was telling us that in Finland they have two to three times higher vitamin D blood levels than we do in Scotland and in the UK, and they have no excess COVID deaths. Now she makes the causal link between the two, but could you shed some light on this for the committee? Is there a case to be made here? To, to to increase or, or to make provisions in the population to increase vitamin D in the population, and will it help? So I think that um, attributing Finland's differences to just vitamin D, that I wouldn't say that that causal link is clear. There's lots of other very good things that Finland has done in its public health response, and the Nordic countries generally, despite what's been happening in Sweden, you know, have had lower numbers overall. Um, so, but there may be something in that. I think the science on this is still emerging. Um, 
we don't fully understand how yet how the virus we know how the virus enters the body but we don't fully understand all the biological mechanisms involved in how it affects our health and um, both in the immediate term with the acute illness and then obviously in recovery which is appearing to be increasingly a big problem that we're going to have to face the so-called long COVID. Um, but there is some evidence that vitamin D may be helpful, and I'm not. This is not my direct area of expertise. Just to emphasise, one big study that was published recently shows that some of the mechanisms may be disrupted by vitamin D levels, and therefore there may be some protection where people have adequate vitamin D levels. We also know more generally that vitamin D is important, particularly for some groups, um, and having adequate access to that vitamin, just in terms of the immune response, is important in general. So I think that it's a not it's not an invasive thing. It's something you can provide to the population safely um, at recommended doses, particularly for older people. And I did read Helen's evidence, and I think that is something. Even if there are unknown scientific questions about it, if we added it to the other measures we're pursuing, I can't see really that it would do any harm. It's not the type of thing that would be contraindicated for a particular groups. So I think it's a useful point that the Helen, who's a GP, has raised. I think it would be good for the committee to perhaps ask that this be explored further, particularly at the time when we're expanding our flu vaccination program. The two in partnership may be useful, particularly for those higher risk groups. Thank you. She, she specifically mentioned care homes and care home workers as being you know, potential beneficiaries of this, particularly over the winter months. Is that something you think would be a sensible thing to do? Yes, I wouldn't be opposed to that at all. And I think that um, as we move forward, particularly when we have higher rates of the virus in the community than we would wish, we need to increasingly look at the groups that are most vulnerable. How can we maximise the protection to those groups? Um, so not returning to shielding, but other measures that we could use, and whether there are interventions of that type or others. So absolutely, I think it would be a good thing to raise with government, with crucially to raise with the chief medical officer, obviously, and ask for his view. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, convener. <coughs> Thank you for that. Um, I turn next to the deputy convener, Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. Um, I think my first question I'll direct to Professor Bold, um, but others can um, respond if they feel they have something to, to offer. Um, Professor Bold, with cases rising again in Scotland, do we have enough information and data to be making decisions about what restrictions and emergency powers are still required? For example, we know that local lockdowns are increasingly happening at local authority level, but data is still only available by health board level, which does not always help with public scrutiny. And I think the, the point you were making earlier on to Shona Robeson about public buy-in, because people need to, to believe what they're, they're being told by government, by politicians and so on. So how could that situation be improved? Um, is there anything else that could be done to improve the availability of test and trace data, for example, to help inform decisions about local restrictions and further regulations? Thank you very much, Monica, for that question. I was hoping that I could raise with the committee some of the um, uh, some of the ways that we could improve the transparency and availability of some of the data. The first thing I would say is that the dashboard that Public Health Scotland produces is excellent, and I know how hard all the analytical teams have been working at scale. Um, and you know, we have some fantastic researchers and experts working on that, not just in Public Health Scotland, but the boards, etc. So they are up to be commended for the efforts. It's, it's improved hugely. It's very valuable for researchers and others. However, there are gaps. So the first one that you point to is, I think, that reporting the data by local authority in the same way as by NHS board is needed. You can actually drill down into that um, if you go through all the tables. It's, it's possible to figure it out. But I think just providing it up front would be very useful to particularly local authority partners. So let's do that. I don't think it's a difficult thing to do. Um, the second thing is that uh, I would like to see, and this is probably a longer term ask, age specific and sex specific data more transparently provided for both the cases and um, hospitalizations. And as you know, Monica, there is currently an issue around how we define people in hospital, which I understand will be resolved 
ICU admissions, etc. So age and sex specific data more readily available. Though again, you can get it if you if you look for it because it's clear all the way through this pandemic that there there's differences by sex or differences by age and there are also as we saw in public health scotland's useful report differences by ethnic minority communities etc so more of that more uh, readily available would be uh, very useful and that would be for tests cases hospitalizations and deaths so all age combined data isn't sufficient and the other thing that would be useful as you say is in terms of test and protect and um, us as i've as I've asked for in the past, and um, what we're getting now is better than it was, but I would still like to have publicly available data on the time it takes for people to be contacted, and, and then to know, not so not just the proportion of contacts that are reached, and then to know what happens uh, with those contacts. Obviously, they're all advised to self-isolate, but are people following that guidance, even if it's a sample that we see data from? What is the adherence, the understanding and the compliance? Is it working, in other words? And then this, the final thing on test and protect is in the testing symptom system, we're testing symptomatic and asymptomatic people. Most people get tested are symptomatic. That's the public because they're coming forward for tests. We have a lot of other people who are now being more routinely tested, care home workers, NHS staff, etc who are just being routinely tested, so they're not symptomatic. So those, that's the asymptomatic group. I'd really like to see a clear breakdown of those two groups because they're quite different populations, and it will give us a sense on the symptom side particularly, how many people are experiencing symptoms, et cetera, or why they're coming forward for tests. And I think those are the main things I wanted to do. There may be a couple of other points I've got on the data just because of limited time that I haven't raised, so perhaps I could send them to the committee, issues that other researchers have have raised, but thanks quite for that question. Thank you. I think that's very helpful, and any further written follow-up would be helpful too, because we do have the Cabinet Secretary um, appearing at committee next week. Um, just a final supplementary to Professor Ball before I read another matter. Um, that's a very helpful in, um, run-through of the sort of data gaps that, that do exist. Um, can you give examples of other countries who do publish data by um, age, sex, ethnicity? Um, and can you give any examples of how that data has been used and how it has informed um, you know, public health measures? Sure. So there are a number of countries that do very well on the data front. I need to trawl into this in a bit more detail, but I know that in Germany there's very good quality data that's available for some of those measures as well. And um, certainly from New Zealand, when earlier in the pandemic, when they put together their equivalent of the public health dashboard, there was more information there. And um, the Canadians do it by province and federally. Uh, again, more data there. So there probably are a number of examples where researchers are able um, to access this. Um, as I say, much of that, with the exception of some of the things I've said, does exist. It's just, I think, um, if it can be reported more openly so that people don't have to trawl through huge Excel tables, which is basically what you often have to do at the moment. That's great. Thank you. I think we all want to improve transparency um, where possible. Can I turn to the issue of adults with incapacity? So this question is... Um, really for the Law Society and the Scottish Human Rights Commission to, to respond to. Um, I know it's been welcomed at the provisions um, which are due to expire at the end of September, um, but we've also had written submissions that express some concerns. Um, there's the response from the Centre for Mental Health and Capacity Law at Edinburgh Napier University. Um, can I ask um, our witnesses if they've made any assessment of the the impact that these provisions have had on adults with incapacity for the duration of the emergency legislation so far, um, do they believe that we have enough information? And is there a need for further independent assessment or information gathering about how many people have been affected potentially by moves to um, reduce delayed discharge, for example? I'll put that to, to Michael uh, first, please, and then Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the, um, in the uh, coronavirus early expiry of provisions regulations, uh, the uh, provisions about care of adults with incapacity, Schedule 3, Paragraph 11.1, has not been commenced yet. So um, uh, we expressed concerns 
Regarding uh, 11.1, uh, we called on the government to confirm that these provisions would not be brought into force um, uh, during the course of the, the uh, Coronavirus Scotland Act 2020 debates, and, um, uh, and on the basis that to do so would cause serious and unnecessary violations of human rights. Uh, so I think uh, in that context, we were particularly concerned uh, that the modifications in Para uh, 11.1 could uh, cause problems about Article 5 uh, of the Convention. Uh, notes that the Scottish Government has examined, it says there, uh, very carefully the considerations in relation to human rights uh, and has determined that these should expire early. So therefore, uh, we, uh, we, we were quite content with that decision. Uh, I hope that covers the point, but you'll no doubt let me know, Ms Lennon, if I have not covered the point. Thank you, Michael. No, that, that, that is helpful. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to see the, the written response from the Mental Health and Capacity um, Law team at Napier. Um, there's maybe not much pressure on that if you have it, but they have raised some further concern. Um, if I can just get to the relevant part. They said, we continue to be very concerned that since the start of the pandemic, adults who lack capacity may have been discharged or moved, so presumably from hospitals, in the main, without due legal process, in what appears to be a violation of Articles 5 and 8 of the ECHR and 12 and 14 of the CRPD. Um, I just wonder if you get anything to, to say on that, um, or perhaps I've not fully understood, but um, I'd be happy to hear from you in writing if that's more appropriate. I, th I think in all the circumstances, it would probably be better for me to take that back and, and have uh, your question particularly considered by our Mental Health and Disability Committee, because I know that they are clearly uh, very interested in uh, these issues, and, uh, the, uh, and, and we have uh, good relationships with those at Napier University. So, yes, uh, if you don't mind, I'll do that. Thank you, Michael. That would be helpful. I'll turn to Sarah. I'm sure Sarah has something to say, but apologies to Sarah, who I think wanted to respond to my earlier question to Professor Ball. So, Sarah, if you want to pick up on that, that first, that, that would be great. Hi, um, thank you. Um, so, just coming back to the, the data point um, that Professor Bold had, um, had spoken about, um, we think it's key to um, be able to collect data in relation to a wide variety of issues. And one topic which we've not spoken about thus far, and which I can go into a bit more detail about, is um, the data in relation to those in pre-trial detention. Now, um, uh, you bear with me. Um, we ourselves can't provide an analysis of how many people are affected by these provisions, and we think it's absolutely vital that um, the committee uh, are able to, uh, to to monitor these issues and to ensure that pre-trial detention can be better monitored and safeguarded. My apologies, my screen seems to have frozen. Can can you still hear me okay? We can still hear you, Sarah. Yeah. Great, perfect. Um, so, so we think it's vital for, for the committee to be able to gather this information on, on pre-trial detention, and it's something that I can talk in a bit more detail about our, our particular concerns um, if, if the committee wish to hear those. Um, so, coming back to um, your question about adults with incapacity, now I'd like to echo um, the comments of my colleague Michael Clancy on this issue. Um, we're delighted to see that um, paragraph 11.1 of the provisions will be expired. Now, as, as Michael had said, the, there is a requirement that state parties provide 
disabled people with access to the support necessary to enable them to make decisions. And that's under um, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, so, as a result, we su we're supportive. Um, we're supportive of, of these being expired. Um, the Commission itself conducted research into the impact of COVID-19 on social care in Scotland. Now, this this full report will be available at the beginning of October, and. During that, the process of gathering the information, we spoke to a wide range of different actors um, and organisations in, re in relation to social care. So, for example, social care providers, disabled per people's organisations, mental health professionals, etc. And as part of that process, we found that there was actually a profound impact on the way in which social care support has been delivered in Scotland. And that's led to significant gaps in the realisation of rights for people who need access and rely on social care support. Now, turning to the evidence um, about the use of the powers, para um, paragraph 11.1 in relation to adults with capacity and removing um, the, the, the need to seek their views and their families' views hasn't come into force. But we did find that one interviewee was concerned about the test for triggering the pr provision, and they felt it was very unclear as to how decisions would be made. So, in particular, um, they said, where do we use it after we gather the evidence? Is it five cases or six, or is it a trend which then triggers the legislation? It's very unclear. They were gathering evidence, but there were no clear mechanisms of how to do that. So this is this is what one interview interviewee said, and they were a mental health professional, and I, I think it demonstrates the, the confusion about the, the legislation and, and what would bring that into force. Um, now the Commission ha hasn't seen any pressing need to justify dispensing with, with the duty to take an adult's wishes and feelings into account. Um, and so that's why we're pleased to see that these aren't used. Now we don't have any data about um, whether people, um, professionals, were um, moving moving people from, for example, uh, hospital settings to residential settings without their consent. But we think this is a vital part of of scrutiny of measures that that we are able to see data and, and find out what's happened in individual cases. And whether their rights um, have been ignored. Um, I can address the committee on on par paragraphs eleven two and eleven three about guardianship orders um, as well, if, if that would be of, of use. Um, so that, yeah, I'm happy for you to do that. I'll be guided by our convener, though, just in terms of how we are for time. I've got no further questions at this point. Uh, thank you, Monica. I, I think, given um, we've got uh, a few members still to ask uh, questions, I think if it's all right with you, Sarah, we might um, uh, uh, perhaps better to put your thoughts down in a brief submission on those particular provisions. Is that acceptable? Yes, absolutely. Uh, th thank you. Um, can I turn next, please, to Maurice Corrie? Kavina, thank you for that. Um, this is a, um, some questions uh, to Professor Bald and Michael Clancy. Um, would you both agree that the regulations bring sharp clarity for the public to the issue in hand, building on the guidance already given by the Scottish Government initially? So just to start, I mean, I, I absolutely, I think I would uh, reiterate my previous points, Morris, about the fact that um, when you have a, a crisis of this scale, it is absolutely appropriate that there are regulations and that they're extended. For all the excellent examples that our other witnesses have been um, providing in relation to how the legal system operates um, and other things, uh, the workplace, uh, as Helen said, etc., and the examples we've given of the need, unfortunately, to have um, not only regulations but penalties associated with 
reaching different parts of the guidance, which is about keeping people safe. So I think that's entirely appropriate. Um, so I'll just be brief there, but that, that is my view. I think it's appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Michael Clancy? Yes. Um, yes, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Corey, for that question. Um, again, we, we've covered some of that earlier in the discussion uh, this morning. I believe that it, it is uh, crucial to have a, a legal structure in place uh, uh, following the coronavirus uh, acts. Um, uh, these are important issues about uh, our liberties, uh, which are concerned, which are, are being dealt with under these uh, pieces of legislation, the, the two in Scotland and the one at UK level, and all the hundreds of regulations made under those acts cumulatively. Um, it, so it's important that we have regulations which uh, make sure that, that uh, the actions of government are lawful and proportionate time limited as, as we've spoken about earlier in the session. I think the, the distinction between guidance and uh, regulation, of course, is, is uh, between advice, uh, be, be it advice given by uh, highly placed people in government uh, uh, and, their, and their advisors, uh, but it is advice. Um, it's not uh, law, and uh, it would be possible for people to say, "Well, I have a different view about advice. I don't, advice is not necessary to take." Uh, but um, I, I think uh, it's it's about how that guidance is then employed, uh, and we've seen that the the uh, police have a sort of structure uh, of uh, trying to uh, engage with people uh, that they may think uh, are contravening the regulations, first of all, to, to point out to them that the guidance say, says that uh, uh, a mask should be worn in this situation or whatever it may be, uh, and uh, then to ramp it up uh, if there is resistance to accepting the advice to uh, reflecting what the law says uh, about these sorts of things. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it's the tone of guidance Way in which it's used as a precursor to uh, the, uh, the that's a that's a, a coherent approach to uh, taking this forward. Thank you. Um, and following on from that, uh, my first question to both of you again, uh, running in parallel to this, of course, could you both agree that there is a need for really effective communications to ensure the successful implementation of those regulations? and targeting the sectors of the population and geographical areas of this country where the issues are particularly bad. And uh, I also draw on the comment by Professor Bold just now, having referred to the long COVID this morning, which obviously gives me slight cause for concern. Would you like to comment on that, both of you? Certainly. So if I start, um, I think that is absolutely the case. And actually, I think, um, Donna Robeson made this point earlier as well, that uh, we're in a difficult period now, and therefore um, clear communication is even more important than it was earlier, I think, in the pandemic, given the complexities of the guidance and the regulations. And so, as I was saying earlier, I think that the, I very much welcome the ongoing daily briefings. They're absent, uh, you know, at UK level, we still have them. They're a helpful tool. But unfortunately, there are lots of people who are not going to be tuning into those um, and maybe relying on other ways to obtain information. So I think it's important that we have um, other agencies who are adequately resourced to be able to convey that public health advice and the detail of the regulations to their populations. And you raise a good point, actually. It may be that when we have local restrictions imposed on an area, we need additional resource and support for agencies in that area, even to do door to door, to purchase um, local radio station time, because local radio is a really important way to communicate, particularly with some communities who listen to particular stations, including in their own language, for example. So I think that we do need that more nuanced uh, communication. Um, and then I suppose the final point is the inequalities of this are stark. Um, the, uh, the more deprived parts of our country have already been badly affected, not just by COVID directly, but by the unintended consequences of COVID, not having access to the normal health care, et cetera. 
Um, so I think those communities in particular need resources. And I know this committee is not looking at furlough or sick pay or these things that are not um, devolved matters, but just to emphasize one of my big concerns and all of us in public health are that people are simply not going to have enough resources in the coming months uh, to weather this storm, whether it be COVID or, or, or not. And finally, on long COVID, um, I think what is concerning me about that is, um, there again, is a new paper from Italy today looking at Bergamo, where they're bringing back in the people who had COVID in March and April and finding, and these are people who were hospitalized, I do emphasize, so be, they would have been more unwell. About half of them have ongoing symptoms, a whole variety of things they're struggling to cope with. So we are going to need to make sure, again, within the NHS, and I know that the Scottish Government is already looking at this closely, that we can support those patients. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And Mark McKenzie? Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. Corey. Uh, the, uh, I agree uh, very much with what Professor Bald has, has uh, said already. Uh, I think um, if one looks at this uh, from the very beginning of, of the, the, uh, the, the lockdown, uh, the, the four-country approach uh, meant that the regulations were pretty much the same um, uh, from uh, Land's End to uh, John O'Groats and uh, from uh, Berwick upon Tweed to uh, in, in Belfast. So uh, it, that her coherence, however, has broken down as each of the uh, countries uh, which make up the UK um, have developed their own coronavirus legislation, uh, and uh, there is a significant amount of it in each jurisdiction. That of itself, if not carefully communicated, it could. It, create the circumstances where uh, people could have potential for confusion about what law applies to them. Uh, and so, therefore, I echo the, uh, the, the comments uh, which Professor Bald has said about uh, communication, proper communication, clear, effective communication about the legal arrangements affecting people in all of the four jurisdictions is essential. Uh, and that will then clear up issues about uh, are we to stay alert or stay at home? Uh, for example, a famous example from uh, uh, early May, um, uh, where people just did not know um, uh, what uh, jurisdictions were being affected, uh, and it creates then uh, a need for uh, the, the uh, jurisdictions that do not have uh, such provisions as stay alert uh, to, uh, to then come and say uh, that doesn't apply here. And of course, as people travel across the country, uh, they may encounter different regimes from the ones uh, which are local to them, uh, and that too has to be communicated very clearly. It's uh, uh, to coin a phrase: it's uh, communication, communication, communication. Thank you. Can I just ask one final question to Professor Ball? You referred to airport testing, and I must declare an interest. I'm a member of the Glasgow Airports Consultative Committee. Uh, you talked about infrastructure problems. What are these, and how, as you see them? So I was just speaking in general terms from a non-expert position, as in I'm not involved in any of the procurement or the setup of any of these services, and I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge. But I think what I was trying to say is that um, I know the airports themselves would be willing and able to set some of this up, um, but you do need government support and government um, involvement. To, to do this, um, and it doesn't, it shouldn't be separate from our national testing system. It needs to be integrated. So, at a time when we're still trying to expand testing at scale for in other settings, I mentioned the numbers in this Scotland's testing strategy. I wouldn't be surprised if just the the, the effort that would be required to get that running at all of Scotland's airports may be just an additional demand that at the moment is not a priority because we're trying to get so many other parts of the testing system operating at scale. That was the general point I made. I'm sure others would be more expert just to point to exactly what the steps would be that would be required to put that in place and what implications that would have for other parts of our testing system. Thank you, President. Thank you, Michael Clancy. Thank you, Gavina. Uh, before turning to the next question, I believe Helen Martin would like to come in on some of those, those questions. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, it was basically just to comment on the issue of um, consistency of message, and I think this is a very vital point going forward. Um, you, you know, wor workers on the ground are consistently um, receiving different messages from employers in terms of what, what the standards are within within their uh, within their um, workplaces, which are often out of step with the wider public health message. So, for example, at a time when the Glasgow lockdown was being extended and a million people were being um, subject to much greater restrictions, we've seen the Scottish Government move to put in a consultation in place in the manufacturing sector that looks at reducing two metres to one metre um, social distancing. We've also seen um, you know, outbreaks and clusterings within manufacturing workplaces. And I think the the plea here is really to think really consistently about that message. And um, if we continue to put um, holes into our public health messaging around two meter social distancing, then it's not necessary in schools. It's not necessary, you know, it's okay to do one meter in hospitality, on buses, and different types of workplaces. I think what that does is confuse the message for uh, for a lot of people. Um, if you know, people are going into work and they aren't having to socially distance. The, you know, the, the standards are not high, and they spend all day in that in that situation. And it is very difficult to get them to then um, maintain very high standards in their in their own life. And I'm concerned that what we might see going forward is an increasing tightening of guidance around home life. So, how many people can come into into your home? But then a loosening of guidance in economic terms. So, and I think people are very conscious of this idea that they are that they don't they're not just economic entities that they have well-being issues, they have a desire to see their family, that that kind of thing. And I think what we really need to do is is to keep that consistency of message, but to keep that balance as well between home life and economic life. And um, I think that's quite that's quite a challenge because the I think the you know, the desire will be to open up the economy as much as possible, but to still control the virus, and that sends you in a very specific direction. So it is important, I think, to to try to keep the message as consistent as possible throughout all areas. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, can I next turn to Annabel Ewing, please? Thank you, Computer, and good morning to our witnesses. And uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. Um, my question would be to Professor Bold. And I mean, taking um, into account the, the, the wide-ranging debate uh, we've had already about the, the role of emergency powers in a pandemic, the need for buy-in from citizens, uh, and then you know, looking ahead to the winter months and what on earth that may bring. Um, I, I guess the buy-in also is linked to um, trust that the government is doing all that it can do to control the, the pandemic. Uh, and in that regard, I know that Professor Bold has, says, has said today and on many occasions that rapid and mass testing are essential. In that regard, I had uh, read an interesting article in the Financial Times, I think, of last week, and they were citing an epidemiologist at the LSE. Julian Cato, and he was suggesting that there should be mass testing of the population, so universal testing, um, together with contract tracing, of course. And he felt that that was the best way to control the pandemic. And he he specifically suggested that the uh, there be adoption of what he called the RT lamp technology, and this apparently is reverse transcriptase loop amplification. Uh, I don't know if my committee can see the convener is looking puzzled. I am you know, indeed puzzled too. I hope Professor Bold is not. Um, but that he suggested that that actually would be um, a, an easy way to, to, for people to test. Uh, it does not involve it's saliva based. It does not involve nasal swabs. That it would be cheap, perhaps about £1 per test or less. That it would be therefore easy to roll out on a wide population basis. Um, of course, it would not replace if there was a positive test the need then to go on and have a, a high tech test to check for false positives. He felt that the sensitivity of the test was sufficient to 
uh, deal with uh, pandemic control issues. And I just wonder if Professor Bold is aware that this is something that is being looked at, you know, uh, here and and elsewhere, and to what extent it is seen as a, a realistic option. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annabelle. So I'm not a virologist, and testing is not testing techniques are not my core area of expertise. I haven't seen that uh, paper. I'll just comment in general terms. The technology is advancing all the time. Uh, I am more familiar in my own work with how you use saliva testing for other purposes, and it's a far less invasive, much easier way uh, to ask people to be tested. And as you know, in the US and, and other countries, they're already actively using that approach more than we are at the moment. So I would support that, and I think we are going to see a lot of development. Uh, testing, uh, the, the technology and our knowledge on testing is expanding all the time. So I guess given that this is not, I don't want to stray at all beyond my areas of expertise, um, I would say in terms of this committee's deliberation, the general point of getting the existing testing system working and expanded at scale is something that I think all members of the parliament should continue to ask for. And then the second thing would be that we look carefully at all the emerging research and best approaches to identify whether within Scotland we could be slightly ahead of the game to embrace some of that new technology in partnership with our excellent research community and um, to take advantage of it. So I think you've raised a very important general point. I'm sure there'll be others in a better place to comment on this. Thank you for that. Uh, and it just seemed that if it if it worked, uh, then and it, the, the the writer suggested it be it could be carried out on a weekly basis. It would seem to be a game changer uh, in dealing with the the pandemic to avoid you know mass blanket lockdowns, which fortunately we're avoiding compared to four months ago at the moment. But we do have the winter to deal with, so uh, certainly it will be an issue I'll be seeking to pursue. Thank you, Professor Bald. Um, my other question would be to Michael Clancy, and I would just like to remind um, members of my Register of Interest declaration, wherein they will note that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland, that I hold a current practicing certificate, albeit that I'm not currently practicing. To return uh, to the issue that was raised, I think, by my colleague Willie Coffey, and Michael Clancy answered at some length in terms of the backlog facing the courts. And we heard, you know, of many developments that have taken place uh, in an attempt to to tackle that. I would just like to clarify with Michael Clancy um, whether he feels that if we didn't go ahead and extend, approve the extension of the emergency um, legislation, including, of course, its provisions on on justice matters, if he felt that a failure to extend would, in fact, put in jeopardy. A, the functioning of the courts whilst we're still in the midst of the pandemic, and B, the um, possibility of starting to uh, tackle in a meaningful way the backlog. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Ewing. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, very much uh, for that question. I think it's fair to say that uh, we support entirely the extension uh, of this legislation um, uh, and that the consequences of not extending it, it could be, uh, well, it, it, it's just unthinkable that uh, it would not be extended at the present time. Um, uh, we, we need to do it uh, uh, to allow for uh, the uh, current arrangements to continue uh, whilst we uh, cope with uh, the crisis. Uh, and until the time the crisis is uh, in very much more manageable and less um, uh, potential uh, for uh, it uh, to, to re-emerge, uh, then I think we should continue with the law. Uh, well, I thank Michael Clancy for that unequivocal uh, clarification, and that's the end of my questions. Thank you. Thank you for that. And finally, uh, questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, convener. I wanted to uh, take us to the Children and Young People's Commissioner's uh, a response to the committee, and in particular, uh, where they say we remain extremely concerned. It concerns it previously raised, 
um, in particular about the detention uh, of young people. And they say the proportion of children and young people detained in Rahman has actually increased. And I just wonder uh, what response uh, members of the panel, probably Sarah Booth and Michael Clancy in particular, uh, might uh, have to say in response to the Children and Young People's Commissioner's uh, input to our deliberations. We take um, Sarah and then Michael, please. Thank you. We have not ourselves undertaken a detailed analysis of, of, of the provisions um, in relation to young people um, in order to avoid a duplication of mandate um, with our sister organisation, the, the Children and Young um, People's Commissioner. Um, but we do, we do know they have particular concerns um, in relation to children's panels, um, attendance of children's hearings, um, and secure placements being a, a depri deprivation of liberty. And we, we also um, understand there are concerns about um, children and young people being detained um, and the fact that there have been no or very few um, children or young people um, released under the early release scheme. Uh, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite content uh, with, with, with that, convener, and I'll let others uh, pick up the battle. <clears throat> Um, Michael Clancy, would you have uh, um, uh, an answer to that question? Well, I, I think I would uh, like to take that back, um, convener, um, uh, and give uh, due consideration to exactly what the uh, Children and Young Persons Commissioner says, um, uh, because my scant notes, which I made uh, over the course of the last couple of days, uh, don't allow me uh, to answer Mr. Stevenson's question fully. Uh, thank you. Uh, Stuart, do you have further questions? Uh, no, I think that uh, will do for now, Convener. Thank you. Well, um, can I take this opportunity to thank all of our four witnesses, uh, Professor Bald, uh, Ms Booth, Mr Clancy and Ms Martin, for attending uh, the meeting this morning. That concludes our business for today. At our meeting next Wednesday, we will take uh, evidence from the Scottish Government on various SSIs, including the two that were on our agenda today and upon which we heard evidence relating to the extension and expiry of provisions in the Coronavirus Scotland Act. So can I thank uh, again our, our panel and colleagues, and I now close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>